worship. Oh, oh, I feel like it's a little bit of uh, cold weather has set in and people in the audience are starting to get into that. I'm going to, you know, put a blanket on and, you know, I'm kind of a little, little dozy and, you know, we got a four day weekend and uh, gosh, we moved those services back a whole 30 minutes and people are getting used to that. And I think some people are just finding it out. But anyway, um, man, I think I should start with some bigger news because I don't, I think y'all are just sitting out there in anticipation right now. So uh, number one, you might notice I got a cast on my hand. All right. I've already been asked several times. I just want to get this over with. It was a, uh, it's called a ratchet strap and it was on the back of my boat and a series of events happened in which I will probably tell a lengthier story at another time for not this sermon, because um, every story is a sermon illustration if you're a preacher. And so um, it let loose on my hand, and I broke my thumb. So um, first cast all my life, and I hate it, and it feels like I'm stupid. So anyway, <laughs> full disclosure, now I've told you the story. And moving on, story number two. Uh, this week, as you guys know, for the better part of a well, depending on when you want to start counting, I count from 17 years ago, um, but uh, 10 years ago is when we started an agreement with the land on a handshake deal for El Dorado, 12 acres, and some of you have been around for a lot of those steps, some of you have been around at the very end, and I want you to know at Genesis Metro Church, if you're new, there is no seniority at Genesis Metro Church. When you walk in, your family is just as valuable as any family that's ever been here. And your family is just as valuable if you give $5 to our capital campaign or you give $500,000 to our cap capital campaign. It doesn't matter the amount. It matters the sacrifice. And we are all going to put our oars in the water and we are going to row to the other side of the Jordan River. And so I want you guys to know that this week, these parallel paths that have been kind of running beside each other have never been in congruence, okay? A lot of math terms there. And so um, the buyer has always had their stuff that they were dealing with to try to get under contract, which we're gonna have a couple of shout outs this morning. Um, number one, uh, Kurt North has been our real estate agent who has worked uh, pro bono for us for the last six months on this deal. And I would say he's put in at least two, three hundred hours, okay? Let's give him a shout out right now. Would you guys honor Kurt? I don't even know if he's in here, but, and he didn't want me to probably tell y'all any of that, but I, I feel like sometimes the Bible says to give honor to whom honor is due, and he's gone above and beyond. And so on Monday, our buyer, we had gone back and forth with our lease agreement contract and they, they signed it. So that meant that our officially our buyer was under contract. Um, Monday, the bank met and then the subcommittee voted unofficially on Monday, voted officially on Tuesday. And then on Thursday, David Anderson acquired the letter funding our construction loan. So now, it's a big day, folks. It's a big day. It's a big day. So, for layman's terms, um, it's like, what does that mean, Tim? It means that, provided that our buyer um, has their their discovery period or whatever you want to call it, uh, they want our building, which they do, and uh, provided that we do not back out, which we won't, um, that means that now with pending city approval, we can literally go out there and turn dirt sometime early Q1 of 2020. So folks, hopefully the Christmas presents that I've asked for, 2020, move in. El Dorado. So I'm, I'm happy to tell you that all of your hard work is paid off and we're going to be able to do ministry at another level. It's not about the building. It's about the people that are going to be in that building. And I think anyone that's ever tried to find this building for the first time, you remember when you drove up here, like you had to know where this was. I don't care if you follow Google. It's like, where? And so anyway, 
I think that it'll allow us to change a lot of lives, and I'm excited for that. And so I wanted to start the service off with, I broke my thumb, but we got a loan. So <laughs> it's been a good week overall. So um, getting mess- started with the message today, uh, we have been doing a series called Keep Casting. And every week we're bringing you an element of the series, and it really isn't so much about fishing uh, when you boil it down. And, and today, we're going to take a deep breath, whew, and we are going to take it up on a philosophical level and on a theological level. But I think that if you if you'll go with me, if you go with me on this journey, it will help a lot of people out sitting in this room, because it's it's a subject that's hard to tackle, honestly, in a 30-minute segment. I think that I can do it this morning, um, but it's going to require you to listen. You might want to take notes, um, but no, you should always be taking notes. What am I talking about? Might want You should always take notes, but, but it, it explains the nature of man, okay? Um, and, and this video that we're going to start with, it's kind of like our introduction every week, Um, you're going to see some of the elements that we faced in inclement weather. We shot this large part of this portion uh, back last October, and it had dropped like it did this week all the way down to, I think, 37, 38 degrees. And this is what happened after that. So we'll watch this and we'll get rolling. Today, it's been one barrier after another. We've been two lakes. We had no bites. Uh, now we got a thunderstorm with lightning. And um, this lake is flooded, so it's like eight foot over normal. So all that leads to difficulties. It's not going well. I mean, every day can't be awesome. Right now, we're kind of embracing the suck. Oh, that's a beat. Oh. You gotta be on your head. Oh, shoot. Oh, shoot. Oh, we got it. <laughs> we are at like a plague level gnats and bees and wasps and everything else. And so we're, it looks like we're swinging. We're not on drugs, but uh, mm, the gnats are getting us. <laughs> well, folks, you know, when we were going out there, obviously, if you're any kind of fisherman, you're always going to check the forecast, right? And I knew that there was going to be rain, and I knew that it was going to be cold, and I dressed for it. But what I learned is that that forecast, it informs my feelings. Because if I go out there with bad information, or if I go out there with no information, and I'm expecting it to be a bright, sunshiny day, and you get out there and it drops to 37, and you got rain pouring down on you and you don't have rain gear, you know what it turns into? It turns into misery. It turns into drudgery because I didn't have all the information. When I thought about that sermon title, Every Day Can't Be Awesome, I just thought that I would throw it out there to you and and I want to see how you feel about that. Let me ask you a question. How many people in here had an awesome week? Just an absolutely awesome week. By show of hands, anybody had an awesome week this week? Okay. Anybody had a challenging, maybe slightly difficult week? Anybody have one of those weeks? Okay. Anybody have a week of absolute hell? Anybody in here? Like, yeah. Okay. Hell and awesome were equal, and the middle was full. Okay. So what does that tell us? What does that instruct us? I think that if we understand that every day can't be awesome, then it can set our expectations. Okay. If the forecast is that every day can't be awesome, then you're not going to be constantly disappointed by unrealistic expectations. And so whenever we have this forecast, it tells us how to feel. And then I know based based upon the information that I'm going to be ready to fight through all of these elements because I have the right forecast. Whenever you think about all the elements of opposition, I think that many people that go to church are actually unaware of what they're fighting against. And we tend to look at flesh and blood as what we're fighting against. We tend to look at, I don't know, who we're married to. We tend to look at maybe sometimes our children. 
Maybe it's our boss. Maybe it's the people in traffic. I don't know who you are fighting with, but I think that you often, if you're not in your word and if you haven't studied what God says about it, then you, you actually don't have the information you need. And when you don't have the information, you don't have the right forecast, then you don't have the feelings that are prepared. Then you go out on what you expect to be a bright, shiny, sunshiny day, and now all of a sudden it's a, it's a deluge, it's thunder, it's lightning, it's waves, and you're overwhelmed because you weren't expecting it. You didn't even know where it came from. And I think today we're going to read a very difficult passage that has some things that are, I'm going to say, they're going to challenge your beliefs, okay? They're going to challenge beliefs in here today. But I also want to encourage you when you're reading God's Word that you need to understand you're debating with God Himself. And you're going to lose that debate, okay? You're, just, that's, you're going to lose. But if you need to adjust your opinion to His sovereign Word, I think you would be more secure in your forecast for your future if you would base it upon what He says versus what you think or maybe what you learned in a college philosophy class. And so, anyway, I'm coming from a background of secular psychology and then my, my, my degree, my graduate degree is in theology. So I think I have a unique perspective on this and I hope that I can bring it to the table today. Romans chapter 7, <clears throat> Paul goes through this exercise of great legalese and I could read all this to you but I think it'd be better for me to summarize it. He said, there's some things that I really want to do. I, the godly things that are in life, the spiritual things, the righteous things, I want to do them. I want to do them. Now, context is everything. This is the Apostle Paul. This isn't you and I. This is the Apostle. We're talking about in the Pantheon, and the, if they had a Hall of Fame for Christians, you know, Paul would be the the logo trophy, okay? So, you know, Jesus is obviously the standard, but like after that, like if you're gonna give a logo MVP of the church, Paul gets it every time, wrote over half the New Testament. And so, mind you, the guy that's gonna write this, that's gonna talk about his struggles, is at the top of the heap, all right? So, if we're comparing like our Christianity to his Christianity, he's already way ahead of where any of us probably are ever gonna get to, but yet he had this struggle. He said, the thing that I want to do, the thing that I should do, Man, I find it hard to do those things. And he said, now at the same time, there's some things I don't want to do. There's absolutely some things I don't want to do. And you know what? He said, I find it so easy to do the things that I don't want to do. I mean, it's almost like I'm on autopilot. He's like, I get up in the morning, I say, do the right thing. And then a couple hours go by, I find myself actually doing the wrong thing. And I didn't even like, I wasn't even trying. I didn't even set out to do the wrong thing. I just simply did the wrong thing. This instructs us. He says, now if I do the thing that I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, which that does not sound like good English. I'm just saying that's the way they translate it in the Bible. So take it up with those grammarians much smarter than I am. But it is sin living in me that does it. Now, if you look at that at face value, you, you say to yourself, is he saying he's not responsible? No. He's saying that there's some sin that's inside of him that he's not in control of. Hmm. Hmm. Do you think that you have any habits that you're not in control of? Have you ever had a sin that had you and you didn't have it? A show of hands. Let's go ahead and vote in church. Anybody ever had a sin that had you and you didn't have it? Okay. You need to think about that. Paul's saying, I realize the sin inside of me is greater than my want to, to do the right thing. Hmm. Verse 21 will be the crux of our first point. So I find this law at work. We're above a theory. We're at a law. 
Now in physics, when you get to a law, that means that it's substantiated, it's verifiable, it's reproducible. Paul said, I found a law. There's a law that's at work in me. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. Whoa, whoa, ho, 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 ha. Evil is, have you, has anybody ever lived this verse? Like you want to do good, but evil is right there with you. You ever go to church and you, you know, you're feeling good. I mean, you're like high-fiving Jesus, maybe for the first time in worship, you're like put one hand, you got to start with one hand, you know, you can't go full out two hands, I mean, but you know, you're in like maybe the one hand, maybe just kind of down here to the side, you know, whatever it is, maybe you just started swaying a little bit, whatever it is, like you're feeling good, you got your Jesus groove on, and then you walk out, and before you get home, all hell has broke loose in the car, it's with the kids, it's with your parents, or it's with your family, what, it's with your spouse, whatever it is, I mean, you wanted to do good, but you sat down in that car, and evil was right there with you, right? Does everybody know what I'm talking about? Is this a stretch? Does anybody not believe this, okay? What I've learned about evil, evil is like that warm blanket that you probably put on yesterday. Evil's like, man, you know what? If you're cold, I'm warm, you know, just put it over your shoulders. And that's the way evil, evil will snuggle with you on any day, okay? Evil takes on so many forms. Evil could be a red dress, in the office next to yours. Evil could be a buddy who constantly pushes you and is willing to be your wingman when you're headed down the wrong road. Evil could be a notification in your inbox, DMs, PMs, whatever they are today, and it's from a long lost friend Maybe a long lost girlfriend, maybe a long lost boyfriend, whatever. You know, we haven't seen each other in years. Hey, I'll just like say hi. Oh, evil. If you don't think it's right there with you, then you don't know the forecast. And if you don't know the forecast, your feelings aren't informed. If your feelings aren't informed, you're going to get overwhelmed. And you'll find yourself in places you never dreamed you would be. Doing things you never thought you would do. Paul said that change seemed impossible. Think about that. I want to do this, but my want to is not greater than my sin nature that's inside of me. I want to put up a diagram real quick. If you'll put the three concentric circles up here, this will help introduce us to our next flow. It's uh, the body, yes, right there. Inside of you, there are three entities. And as we read through the rest of our text, I hope that you'll be informed when you leave here. Whenever you sin, whenever you're tempted, I want you to know where it comes from. I want you to know the forecast, okay? I want you to be able to prepare yourself. I want you to be able to begin to fight against the elements that are trying to oppose your future. And so the Bible says this is where these things come from, your flesh. So you'll notice that these are concentric circles, and you could really put any of the labels wherever you want to put it, but the flesh is kind of referred to as the outside part of your being. The flesh is what fell in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned. It says as a result of Adam's sin, that sin was passed on to all mankind. Now, that means that it's in the DNA. Someone doesn't become a sinner when they sin at two, at three, at four, when they rip the blanket out from their sibling and like, mine, or whatever it is. That's not when sin, sin is something that comes out of our nature, okay? So the flesh we're gonna get into in just a moment is sinful, and we're going to find out that in the end, it cannot be redeemed, that, that you'll never get to a point where your flesh doesn't want to do these things, doesn't want to sin, isn't actively against you and what is best for you. So then on the inmost part of your being, 
You have your spirit. That is the thing that calls out to God. That's the thing inside of all of us. The Bible says that God has put eternity in our hearts. No matter where you're at, no matter what time you were at, there is something that God put inside of every living soul that yearns from the deepest part of you to find purpose, to find meaning, to find eternity. And so when Jesus talks to Nicodemus in John chapter 3, he says you must be born again. He's talking about the Spirit. Because Nicodemus is like, how can I, I'm not, I, can't, I can't get back in the womb. Like, it's not possible. So he's not talking about the flesh. He said that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I tell you, you should be born again. So he's talking about our spirit. So the part of us that is redeemed, the part of us that is born again, the part of us that the Holy Spirit indwells at the moment of belief, Ephesians 1.13, it says that is God's guarantee of our salvation. Our salvation is secured by grace. And so anyway, the part that God is working with is our spirit. Now between the flesh that is evil, cannot be tamed, will not be tamed, will pass away. That's why the Bible says you'll get a new body, okay? Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But this mortal shall put on immortality. So that part of you is your spirit. Now the part between your spirit and your flesh then is your, let's say it all together, is your mind. 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 The part that is the battlefield is your brain. Is how you think. Is your emotions how you feel. Do you think you can consider a time where you ever felt the battle going on? Has anybody ever felt that? That tension between your flesh and your spirit and in your mind you feel like it's scrambled eggs up? Does anybody else have this, like, well, I don't know. I don't know what to think. I don't know what to feel. That's the battle. That's the battle that's going on inside your brain. Listen, Romans 7, 22. He says, for in my inner being, that is my spirit, I delight in God's law. This is a born-again person. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind. The flesh is waging war against my mind. He says, it's making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. Okay, we got to unpack this. All right, here we go. Everybody, let's take a deep breath on the count of three. One, two, three. And let it out. Have you ever heard of nature versus nurture? Anybody ever heard of that? Okay. This is psychology 101. This is philosophy 101. This is the great existential debate on whether or not we are what we are born or are we a product of our environment is it binary that you have to choose between what you're born or, or is it something that can be, well, I'm going to try to answer that philosophical discussion that's been going on for a couple of thousand years in roughly seven minutes. And so let's talk about our nature, DNA, what's hardwired in us, okay? We don't choose our DNA. Our DNA is chosen for us. When the sperm and the egg come together and they form a set of chromosomes, every scientist in the world agree that is a unique life at that juncture. It's going to produce a unique human being. There has never been another one like that one, okay? So consider for just a moment that certain people have predispositions. And we all look at our children, and we readily say these things, right? Whenever we see our son do something, we're like, oh, they're just like their mother. They're just like their father. And we usually say it in the negative, you know, like, oh, you must have got that from your mother. You must have got that from your father. And then, like, every now and then you'll hear somebody like, oh, they're just like Grandpa Willie. Anybody, like, know what I'm talking about? I personally don't like this game because I believe, you know, God made them who they are. But, yes. Do I see tendencies in my children that I have? Yes, they're predisposed to 
being like me. But I think that we can mistake correlations with causality. And this is where you get yourself into trouble. If you went down to the ER and they said the last 10 patients that flatlined had on shoes, you could jump to this conclusion then, we should never wear shoes. Shoes are killing people left and right because there's a correlation between people dying and having shoes on. You see what I'm saying? You have to be careful how you interpret data because you could start saying because there's correlations that it's causing it. Be careful with that. Similarity does not mean the same, okay? So whenever we think about our nature, if it's locked in and we have no choice, then what is the point? Because my father was not a godly man, was predisposed toward having some habits that were addictive, and there wasn't a whole lot of dialogue that went on in my house about anything substantive. And the relationship was one that was chaotic between my mom and my father. Now, if that's in my DNA, does that mean that I'm doomed? Are these factors in the equation or are they the fate of the equation? You need to think about that. I think the Bible is going to argue that these are factors, but they are not your fate. They are options, but they are not your outcome. So the nature is that you have DNA that's passed on that makes you predisposed towards certain habits, toward even certain health issues that you might have, heart disease that runs in your family. So you have to be careful about that. You have to maybe take some precautions about that. But if you have heart disease that ran in your family because they smoked and they drank all the time, well, wait a minute, did that factor into the reason why they had heart disease that they wouldn't have done those things? They might not have had that. So does it run in your family or was it a consequence of their actions? You see what I'm saying? It's not as easy as you think that it is. The Bible says that what's hardwired in us, our DNA, is that we are sinners. Does anybody disagree with this? Okay. Has everybody sinned in here? That makes you a sinner, okay? If you didn't say yes, the Bible says any man that says that he has not sinned is a liar, lying, sin. Welcome to the club. So, <laughs> nature of human depravity, according to the Bible, Paul said, it's in me. And it's making my mind a prisoner. If you don't know the forecast, you have all these prisons that have been built up in your mind. Okay? You, your flesh doesn't take a day off. Your flesh wakes up every day when you wake up. Matter of fact, it doesn't even go to sleep when you go to sleep. Your flesh is plotting on you, okay, on the daily of how it can draw you into sin. And Paul, at the top of the heap, said, sometimes I feel like I'm powerless, he said, my flesh is making my mind a prisoner. He's at the top of the game and saying this is a struggle for him. If it was a struggle for Paul, then that informs us. That's the forecast. Guess what? It's going to be a struggle for you. How you think about things, you need to know there's a war going on in your mind. How you feel about things, there's a war going on in your mind. What you're going to do next and the decision that you're going to make, if you think for a moment that that decision isn't trying to be influenced by a flesh that is not redeemable, then you don't even know what you're fighting against. You're going out there on the lake. It's going to be a great day. Oh, it's so great. And the storm, man, is going to take you out if you just go with how you feel. If how you feel is based upon your flesh, you're losing. You can't go on your feeling. You have to go down into your spirit and find the God stuff. Because the God stuff is going to lead to the good stuff, nature. How about nurture? Nurture would, would talk about the proximity of the people you're around or what influences then who you become. So then you're a product of all of your experiences. Mm -hmm. Well then, if it is science and it is settled, then it would be reproducible in every person. But then how would you explain 10 born? If I'm a product of my environment and there was no God in my environment, how would it, I ever become a preacher? 
it would seem if I was a product of the way I was nurtured, I would end up an atheist. And yet here I stand preaching God's word. Vice versa, I've seen people that are raised in Christian homes with nothing but Christian love, and yet they go a different way. They go the way of the prodigal. They walk away from God and church. If it's science and it's settled, then it has to be repeated every time in order for it to be your fate. So are there patterns? Yes. Do patterns mean permanent? No. And here's the good news. What if I told you nature plays a part? You have a sin nature. Nurture plays a part. The crowd you're around is going to influence what you do. But what if I told you that it's not nature, it's not nurture, it's neither, and it's the fact that in the end, the pattern does not have to be repeated because there's, a, there's one more factor that we can introduce in the equation. Paul said that my sin nature is making my mind a prisoner. The battlefield is raging for my mind. Verse 24, he says, what a wretched man that I am. He's throwing his hands up in the air. He's putting the white flag up. And he says, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Man, if the apostle Paul came to the place that said, I need someone to rescue me, what prideful person would sit in this room today and say, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. I mean, yeah, do I got some flesh that's been kicking my butt all week? Yeah. I mean, do I not do the things that I want to do in my marriage? Yep. Do I say that I'm going to do them this week? Yep. Do I, do I say that I want to parent this week? Yeah. But do I do those things? No. And do I want to start a new, do I want to have a positive outlook on life? Do I fall right back into the negativity? I mean, yeah, I keep, well, at some point, when will you cry out? When will you get to the place of desperation that the apostle Paul himself got to? And he said, I need someone to rescue me from this body of death because my body is winning and my spirit is losing. And he cried out, he said, who shall rescue me from this body of death? And I'm so glad that there is a next line in this verse. He said, I thank God it's through Jesus Christ, my Lord, that he can save me from myself, that he can produce in me a different way of thinking than how I was raised, that he can break the pattern that has been in my father's life, my father's father's life, but it does not have to be in me. That is my sin nature, but when I'm born again, I get a God nature, and then every day, you got to show up for the fight. You need to know that when you wake up, you got to fight. Since you've been sitting in here, your mind, what is it doing? It wants to wander. It doesn't want this truth. It doesn't want to reach out and grab it. It doesn't want to change these things. And so there's already a battle going on where I can just get through this sermon. I can just get through this sermon. And I can get out of here. I know. Quit talking to me. Your flesh is winning. Your spirit wants to be fed. Where is that choice going to be made? In your mind. In your mind. That you have to wake up and say, I'm going to fight against my flesh every day. And if I don't fight against my flesh, I'm doomed to repeat those patterns. And it's not the patterns of your family. It's the patterns of all humanity since we fell in the garden. And those patterns always lead to death and destruction and decay. And everything that is God, leads to life, it leads to hope, it leads to redemption, it leads to grace. Man, but you gotta choose it with your mind. I promise you, you can get out of that prison of the way you've been thinking all your life. I promise you, you can break that pattern that's been, you've been in that prison since you were in your childhood with Jesus, you can get out, you can get out, and then you can build a new pattern, something that your kids can look at and at least see the example so that they can make an informed decision. 
Oh, that looked like health. That looked like it was positive. That looked like it could withstand the tests that life throw at you. Yes, they built something that was able to stand. Let's pray today. I've given you the forecast. The forecast is the flesh desires to beat you and to imprison you. And you need to know that until you breathe your last, that's the way that it is. I don't think a lot of believers know that. I think they think that all of the acting upon them is external. But there's a certain freedom in knowing it's not external, it's internal. That if I can win the fight within me, that I can stand up by God's strength to any fight that's against me. I'm just going to guess there's someone in here that needed to hear this sermon. That you walked in, in here and your mind has been in a prison, not thinking correctly, not even knowing maybe where it comes from. And you thought maybe that's the way that my dad did it, so that's the way that I, I'm doomed to repeat it. I have to. And I'm telling you, by the grace of God, there's another way. Let's just take a moment, church. Let's pray. Let's pray for all the prison doors to open up in just a moment. Would you do that? Would you begin praying right now? Say, God, I pray. If my mind has a prison in it, and I'm not thinking the way that I should think. God, show it to me. I don't want to be in prison anymore. If someone in your family, you know they're in a prison, you see the struggle. You got teenagers, you see the struggle. You see the patterns that were so destructive in your past, and you see those predispositions rising up. No one is doomed to determinism when Jesus Christ steps into the equation. If he can call the dead back to life, he can set your, your mind free from the prison that you're in. We're gonna take a moment and we're gonna worship. And what I've learned is when we worship with all of our heart, with all of our soul, and with all of our mind, that your, your the sin that's inside of you is repelled by the level of worship that's in your life. I'm going to ask you at this time, would you stand with us and would you begin to worship until your mind is set free?